Members, I apologise for the delay in the commencement of today's sitting. The delay became necessary because I had to seek legal and procedural advice, and it was more appropriate to commence the sitting after I had received this advice rather than have this issue raised on the floor with satisfactory consideration. A number of members have indicated to me that they wish to table a motion that the standing orders be suspended today for the purpose of allowing the Assembly to consider a private member's bill on the defence of the unborn child, and that if the Assembly agreed that this bill would complete its passage today. I have given very careful consideration to this matter, and I am very clear that further to the provisions of Section 39 of the Northern Ireland Act, that the Assembly must elect a Speaker and deputies with cross-community support as its first item of business. The Assembly cannot undertake any further business until this happens. If the Assembly elects a Speaker and deputies with cross-community support, then it can proceed to carry out further business. In line with the provisions of Standing Order 11.3, the business to be transacted at today's sitting, of the is, today's sitting shall be the specific matter or matters referred to on the notice given to me as Speaker. As, as neither a motion to suspend the Assembly standing orders nor notice of the introduction of a bill which should complete its passage in one day, were included on the notice, these items of business cannot be transacted at this sitting. The Assembly might carry out this business today. There are two paths that could provide for this. Firstly, if the Assembly successfully elects a Speaker and deputies, then further business can continue. That means the Assembly will have the opportunity to agree the motion on the order paper, which addresses the date when the Assembly shall next meet and business committee membership. If that motion was agreed, then it would be for the business committee to decide when the next sitting should be and what business should be considered at that sitting. It would be for the business committee to decide whether it wishes to have a further sitting today, which the suspension of standing orders and the passage of bill might be considered. Secondly, the provisions of Standing Order 11 for notice to be given to me or my successor by not less than 30 members of the Assembly should meet at an earlier date than that to which it stands adjourned for the purpose of discussing a specific matter of urgent public importance. If a valid notice with 30 signatures was received calling for a further sitting today, this could provide an opportunity for what has been sought. Even if a notice was received with the business proposed on it, it would still have to have the necessary, still be necessary to elect a speaker and deputies with cross-community support before any further business could be transacted. It should also be noticed that, noted that any motion to suspend standing orders also requires cross-community support. I want to make it clear that I am making these points without prejudice to any legal considerations that I or my successor might need to give in relation to the specific motion which I understand has or will be tabled. I understand there are strongly held views involved today on both sides of very sensitive issues, and we are in an extraordinary uh, position. However, as Speaker, I also have to give very careful consideration to the procedures of the Assembly. It is reasonable to say that it cannot be considered good practice to seek to take legislation through the House on a given day without time for scrutiny or for members to amend it. So I realise that many members will be unhappy with this ruling. But in conclusion, I am clear that the Assembly cannot do any business until a Speaker and Deputy Speakers are elected.
A point of order, Mr. Kevin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you rightly make the point about normal procedures uh, being followed, and that is the, the desired way to do it. Uh, only if Westminster had done so in re relation to the Executive Formation Act 2019 that has forced us to this situation. That said, uh, Mr. Speaker, the points that you have raised are points that I considered and sought specific legal opinion from the Attorney General for Northern Ireland, who is also the guardian of the rule of law, and that includes being superior to any legal counsel that exists in this place that has advised you on this issue. And in respect of that, I asked about uh, Standing Order 77, and uh, the Attorney General provided a response to that, where he says that pursuant to Standing Order 77, this could pass to permit the consideration of your bill, which I have uh, provided text for. And while you're aware that Section 39.1, which, Mr. Speaker, which you have alluded to, uh, which intimates the election of a, a Speaker should come first, Section 39.1 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 provides that as its first business, the Assembly shall elect a presiding officer. No adverse consequence is pre prescribed for the failure to elect a presiding officer and the old presiding officer remains in office unless conditions in section 39.2 are satisfied. If the Assembly considers that election of a presiding officer is not possible, the Assembly is not thereby placed in a straitjacket in which nothing can be done by it. The Assembly is master of its own procedure and Standing Order 77 can permit that principle to be made effective. The legal advice goes on uh, and refers to Section 5.5 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, which prevents any irregul irregularity in Assembly procedure being used to impeach the validity of an Act of the Assembly. If the Assembly were to suspend standing orses, uh, orders on the basis that the election of a new presiding officer was not possible, uh, any bill that is therefore enacted would not be any less valid by virtue of Section 5.5. The legal opinion of the Attorney General, the guardian of the rule of law, is crystal clear on this issue. If the Assembly had ever intended to follow the procedure which you have outlined, Standing Order 77 would have put in and inserted subject to the provisions of Section, 9, uh, Section 39.1 and Standing Order 11.3. It doesn't for a very genuine and real purpose because this place needs to have the ability to respond in exceptional circumstances. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is a valid, legally competent recall of the Assembly. And as such, it is permissible on the basis of the legal opinion that I have sought to proceed with the suspension of standing orders under Standing Order 77. And I so propose, Mr. Speaker. Um, I agree entirely with what Mr. Given has said. And this really does come down to an issue of whether or not this assembly is master of its own proceedings. And where we find the answer to that is both within the Northern Ireland Act and the Standing Orders. And Standing Order 77 provides very emphatically and in a totally unfettered way the opportunity for this Assembly, if it is the will of this Assembly, to suspend all of its standing orders, subject to one reservation and one only, that it can only be done on a cross-community vote. There is no further fetter in Standing Order 77. There is nothing which requires it to be subject to any other standing order or any provision of any legislation. And the legislation, the section in which you seem to take refuge, Mr. Speaker, is Section 39 of the Northern Ireland Act. And you have decreed that because it says, shall elect as its first business a speaker, a presiding officer, you have then concluded that it can do none other. Well, as Mr. Given has referred you to, a matter such as this has been litigated upon in the highest court at the time in the land, the House of Lords. 
When Peter Robinson took an action against uh, the first and deputy first minister of the time, and the House of Lords wrote that when it comes to interpreting the word shall, you interpret it in its context. And therefore you look to see, is there a context such as you shall do such and such, and if you don't, these consequences flow. And when you apply that test to section 39, there is no such context. It does not say you shall elect a speaker, and if you don't, no further business shall be done. So when you marry that with the unfettered discretion in section 39 and pay due regards to what the House of Lords has said, then there is absolutely, I submit, no reason why Mr. Given's proposal to suspend standing orders subject only to cross-community support cannot be heard and most certainly should be heard. And if it is not, of course, there's a facility in Schedule 10 of the 1998 Act for the Attorney General to test the matter elsewhere. I thank the two members uh, for their points of order, and I do uh, pay tribute to the research which they have done and the knowledge of uh, Mr. Allister in, in his uh, former, former life. Um, you will understand, both of you will understand, that I have taken legal counsel on the matter. Uh, there has been much deliberation. Um, we have uh, looked at historical cases, um, and I am clear that with all of that, all of the advice, that we are proceeding down the right, the legal path within standing orders today. Point of order, Mr. Pruitt. Well, thank you for that. Um, given that this was, matter was brought to your attention this morning, and the intention to do this was brought to your attention this morning, and the time that was given to your legal advisors um, to, to research matters, um, did they bring to your attention that something dealing with not quite an identical but a very similar circumstance had already been tested in the highest court of the land? And did they advise you of that uh, in allowing you to come to the decision uh, that you have came to? Because it strikes me that if we're acting in defiance of what the law lords um, decided back in 2002, then you're taking the assembly into a very dangerous place. And if that advice wasn't given to you, I think that you'd be better at this point to adjourn and seek further advice as opposed to take us down a path uh, which could lead us into conflict with the courts. Yes. yes. Um, the uh, legal advice that I've given did take into consideration the Robinson case and took into consideration cases that have come about since the Robinson case. Uh, having heard what my colleagues have put to you this morning and the fact that uh, my colleagues have shared the legal advice from the Attorney General, as I understand, with your office, would it not be in order for you to share your legal advice with members at this time and to give us the opportunity to look at that legal advice? I think from an equality of arms point of view, it would be the right thing to do. And I think given that we've already delayed the sitting today, we should delay the sitting again to allow us to look at that legal advice. I think that was a question that was asked um, uh, at the uh, meeting with the speakers. That would not normally be the case. Um, and first, former First Minister will understand that. This is an unusual and abnormal situation. And uh, I have sought the opinion of the Attorney General. I note that you have yet to say that you have sought the opinion of the Attorney General. I have requested the Attorney General to be here. He is here. He has indicated that he is available to provide you advice. And given the magnitude of this decision that you are taking, Mr. Speaker, contrary to the wishes of those that want to put it forward, however, remains to be tested, I would appeal to you. 
adjourn the, the meeting, have a meeting with the Attorney General and go through these issues. Then you will have taken the advice that we have and you can come to a more definitive position based on all of the information. I would implore you to do so. I have taken the Council of the Legal Services within the Assembly on the matter. I have indicated to you that they have considered the cases that you made reference to and the cases that Mr Allister uh, made reference to. And I have set out uh, two paths uh, which the members can pursue if they are uh, willing to, to, to go down those paths. I am clear, uh, and I, I do not take this matter lightly. Believe me, I do not take this matter lightly. But I am clear what my responsibilities are, and I am content that the advice given to me is in line with the best legal advice. Mr. South Tyrone did indicate that uh, request that that advice was shared, and you said that would be unusual or abnormal. Uh, that, of course, was tested in another place um, with regards to the advice related to Brexit from the Attorney General uh, to the, the Prime Minister. And that, of course, was the case that the Parliament actually did receive the advice. And I would formally request that you do provide us that advice and that we have an opportunity to scrutinise that advice and adjourn for a period of time to allow that to happen. I do, I do acknowledge the case that you, you uh, outlined um, in Parliament. Um, I, I was asked the question at the meeting with the whips. We do not normally share that advice, but I have indicated to you the breadth of the advice on which the legal uh, staff in the Assembly have given consideration to. Uh, I have to say, Mr Speaker, you mentioned you would not normally share legal advice, and we know that. This is not a normal sitting of the Assembly. This is a sitting to deal with some of the most fundamental issues that can affect our society today. And I implore you to take an adjournment to allow us to have that legal advice so that we can have that equality of arms. And I have to say as well, to say that you have taken the breadth of legal advice and that you're satisfied with that legal advice whilst not acknowledging the fact that the Attorney General has given different legal advice, is not the right route to go down. And I implore you once again to share the legal advice with all of the members of this Assembly, even those who are not here, so that we can take a fully informed view about this matter, because these are abnormal days, Mr Speaker, and we are in a very abnormal situation. Um, you understand there is a very uh, there's a discussion going on at the table here. Um, I have, and I, at the risk of repeating myself again, I've taken the counsel in the matter. I am content with the advice that has been offered. Um, I have already indicated that um, the legal advice uh, is 
uh, confidential and privileged. And, and I think really on this decision, I know this will not be uh, readily accepted, but the decision on the um, questions of procedure and advice is final. Further to the points of order that have been raised, you, you have indicated that you have outlined a pathway for this motion to be brought forward. The problem with that is it is not a pathway. It is a cul-de-sac to the same problem that we cannot overcome, which is the election of a speaker. Members opposite have indicated they are not supporting the election of a speaker. Therefore, based on your decision, we are handcuffed, and you are handcuffing the Assembly from, in my view, and the view of the Attorney General, from continuing to carry out its business, which we can do under Standing Order 77, recognising the unusual circumstances that we face. Now, I appreciate that you're taking advice from those beside you and notes are coming in from your legal team, and it's rather unseemly, Mr. Speaker. I would again say, adjourn, put us in a room, bring the Attorney General into that room with your legal people, so that you, Mr. Speaker, could, it is you alone that takes this decision. Yeah. Advice is advice. You, under law, are the decision maker, and we want to ensure that you have all of the information at your disposal, and not hearing directly from the Attorney General, I feel, is not providing you with the information, and it is not treating this issue with the kind of seriousness, Mr. Speaker, that I believe that it deserves. It is ultimately and gravely a matter of life and death. I can add anything more to what I have already said, Mr. Given, in response to all of the previous speakers. Point of order. Uh, point of order in terms of the election of Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, when I. Can I just ask you to remain seated? Let me follow out the normal procedures and then we will have an opportunity for points of order. I wish to advise you that since the Assembly's last sitting on the 13th of March 2017, several members have resigned or ceased to be members of the Assembly under the Northern Ireland Assembly Disqualification Act 1975. A number of new members have also taken their seats. I refer you to an old party notice 208 22 that I have issued today, which provides the dates of each resignation and the date when each new member took their seat by giving the undertaking, signing the role of membership and entering their designations. This was done in my presence or that of the Deputy Speaker, the Clerk, Chief Executive. I welcome the new members and wish them well. Before we proceed within the first item of business and before I take any points of order, I want to acknowledge that members on all sides have very strong views about being here today and indeed to make two points. Firstly, there are legal constraints on how much business we can conduct today depending on the decisions the Assembly takes. I will address these issues as we proceed but it is important, it is important that everyone's expectations be clear about the form from the start. Secondly, and more importantly, members are aware that our sitting today is in the context of some extremely sensitive issues. Members will feel passionately about them, and members in this chamber will have the right to express them. However, members also have a responsibility to express those views and to listen to the views of others respectfully. Many others will be watching these proceedings and the Assembly should set an example for the wider debate in our community. Therefore, I remind members of the importance, the importance of tone and respect. If that is clear, we then move on and I take a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, given the fact that the Good Friday Agreement envisages uh, an assembly, a power-sharing executive, North-South Ministerial Council and other bodies. Is it the case uh, today that if we do not have the nominating officer here from Sinn Féin that no executive will be formed? 
Uh, therefore, uh, there will not be able to be an executive Northern Ireland Assembly North South Ministerial Council. It is our clear view, it is the Good Friday Agreement's clear view, that the best way to effect any change to any legislation is to do it uh, within the, the confines of those structures, uh, and that it will not happen as part of a shadow uh, assembly. We will not be part uh, of supporting uh, the introduction of a shadow assembly, which will not affect, affect any change at all, but will only lead to the fundamental destruction of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, is it the case, Mr. Speaker, that without uh, members uh, here present to my right, or who should be to my right, uh, that there will not be an executive forum today? Because if that is the case, then we will be in no position to support a speaker and allow for uh, the undermining of the Good Friday Agreement through uh, a unionist-dominated uh, shadow assembly. Now, the member will be. The member has moved way beyond what are my duties uh, today. My duties today are to provide the, at the commencement of this the election for a speaker and deputy speakers. If a speaker and deputy speakers are elected, then the role of the incoming speaker will be to move forward on the election of the other office holders. To elect speaker and deputy speakers, we require cross-community support. Point of order, Mr. Allister. Is it correct that if the Assembly were to elect a Speaker and Deputy Speaker, speakers, but was not able to form an executive, it could nonetheless proceed to do business in this House, which could include private members' bills uh, to seek to make uh, legislation, and therefore does it follow, if that is correct, that those determined to thwart the election of a Speaker are in effect thwarting the possibility of taking action to defend the unborn, whose voice has, cannot be heard here today, but whose voice is the one crying out to us all in this chamber? And is it not a tragedy that the SDLP, who proclaim themselves as a pro-life party, will take a step, it seems, to stop a Speaker being elected, knowing that that stops legislation to prevent the introduction of Section 9 of the appalling Act from July. Are both those things correct? Let me respond to Mr. Allister uh, first, and then we'll, we'll come to you. Um, I, I think, Mr. Allister, you are quite clear, and I don't think you actually need uh, me to explain to you what, what the procedures and the non-adhering um, to the procedures. If the ministerial offices are not filled, this does not prevent the Assembly from proceeding to debate private members' motions or having further sittings to consider non-executive business. I think Mr. Mr. Allister has made my point for me. The Good Friday Agreement is absolutely 100 per cent clear. Executive, power sharing executive, Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, North South Ministerial Council, at any point over the last thousand plus days, those institutions could have been restored. People on these benches have tried hard. We've offered proposals to get those institutions back in place. But it is absolutely clear to us today, notwithstanding any particular issue, that those issues, no issue will be dealt with by this House or by an executive unless two of the parties, DUP and Sinn Féin, get their act together and get an assembly and executive form. We will gladly, and that is why we're here, that is why we're here, that is why we're here today, Mr. Speaker. We will gladly take part in those institutions, but we will not be party to a stunt that is, that is using and abusing people's uh, emotions and sensitivities over a very, very difficult issue which could have been dealt with at any point over the last thousand years and because this last thousand days, but because this is not a serious attempt to do that, because this will only undermine the principles of the Good Friday Agreement and the fundamental thing that people voted for, we will not participate in this stunt any longer and we will be not providing uh, cross-community support for the election of the Speaker. Thank you. Let me, let me just respond. Well, let me just respond. 
Okay. I'll take a point of order from Mr. Allister and then to Mr. Stanford. Uh, could you just clarify, Mr. Speaker? You've already said that if a speaker was elected, and the SDLP clearly are her mind to thwart that, if a speaker was elected, the Assembly could debate motions. Could it also then, at that stage, suspend its standing orders to allow the introduction of private members' bills? So by stopping the election of a speaker, not only are motions being prevented, but the opportunity through Order 77 is being thwarted to actually pass legislation on this issue. I think just in response to I think you already know the answer to your question, but really, until we elect a, a speaker and deputy speakers, then we are, we are not going anywhere. But Mr. All right. Sorry. Roy Beggs. I acknowledge that it is the changes that were brought into the running of this assembly and the appointment of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister following St Andrews which has created this impasse. Would the Speaker acknowledge that the changes to the procedures in this Assembly for the appointment of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister has actually put a blockage in the system where one or other of the big parties can prevent the establishment of the Executive and thereby they are abusing their position of power? Uh, that, that may be something you feel, but that's a political point rather than a point of order for today's proceedings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, further to Mr. Alistair's point around the opportunity to table uh, private members' legislation in the absence of a Northern Ireland executive, will the Speaker confirm that, given the passage of the Assembly uh, requires a committee stage, can legislation actually fully pass through this House, given the fact that committees cannot be established in the absence of a Northern Ireland executive? And, and saying that, does that mean that any attempts to try and uh, pass legislation in, in the absence of a Northern Ireland executive will indeed fall? And a lot of this exercise is fruitless. I, I think the, the answer really, Ms. Sugden, is that we do not need statutory committees for it to happen. Mr. Speaker, uh, in light of your decision uh, not to suspend standing orders uh, and to allow that motion to proceed, um, which I deeply regret. Um, that you have taken that decision, given the issues, given the genuine motivation of what today was about. And I want to commend those organisations, the tens of thousands that came to this place who wanted MLAs to get back in here. For our constituents across Northern Ireland that want us to get back in dealing with health, education, infrastructure, all of the everyday issues that we are elected to resolve, and that the SDLP have now decided that they will not support the election of a speaker. Therefore, that thwarts the opportunity for an election to take place, which would have created an assembly that has legislative powers. It wouldn't be a shadow assembly. The people are crying out that we reach out towards each other, that we stop poking each other in the eye, or we're going to go blind. And we need people on the other side of this chamber to respond to those of us that want to work with them. And that goes for all of those that aren't here. But they have decided not to participate in that, and that's something that I think the public will fail to understand. This institution provides a platform for us to have those debates, those conversations, to build relationships. That should be happening. It's what the people expect. And therefore, because the SDLP are not here, the election of the Speaker cannot now take place. We'll no longer, as a party, be participating in the rest of these procedures, and we'll be leaving the chamber now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I've been very generous in relation to points of order, but could I say, could I make two points? 
until this moment, until this day in Northern Ireland, the safest place for an unborn child was in the sanctuary of its mother's womb. Sadly, from tonight, the most dangerous place for some unborn will be in the mother's womb because the wanton decision can be taken to kill it. That's really what we're talking about. And that is something which rightly provokes a lot of feeling. And it's a matter of immense regret to me that this House has not been able to face up to that situation. And the second point I wanted to make, it's an illustration of the absurdity of the governmental arrangements in this place, that a party such as Sinn Féin, who doesn't even want Northern Ireland to exist, can by a veto prevent this House from effectively doing any business. And unless or until that has changed, there is no hope for these institutions. Uh, it's a political opinion, and obviously you have placed your concerns on record, Mr Alistair. Mr Stalford. Uh, Mr Speaker, on a point of order, you have been asked on more than one occasion now um, by my colleague, the member for Fermanagh and South Throne, if you will indeed publish the legal advice that you were given. I think that it is important that we see that in the context of the fact that the Attorney General, the most senior law officer in Northern Ireland, gave advice that would have allowed for the opportunity uh, for the motion to be debated here. I really do think that it's important that people see the advice upon which the decision was made that this House would not be in a position to save the lives of unborn children. Based your concerns on record, sorry. To that point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker, before we do leave this place today, it is incumbent upon me, and uh, I'm thankful to Mr. Alistair for raising the points that he has raised, to say how terribly sad I am today about this situation. We had the opportunity today to elect a speaker. We had the opportunity today to bring forward legislation to stop Stella Creasy's amendment coming into effect into Northern Ireland, a place that we're all very proud of, and a place where today we will have the most liberal abortion laws anywhere in Europe. Just think of that for a moment. Northern Ireland will have the most liberal abortion laws anywhere in Europe. I think this is a shameful day for those who haven't come. I think when they reflect on it and when we realise that we have no regulatory system now in place for abortions in Northern Ireland, that it is something that has been decriminalised by 12 o'clock this evening, and it is with incredible sadness that we should mark this day. And there will be some today who will celebrate today. I, I would have to say this is not a day for celebration for the unborn, Mr. Speaker. It is certainly not a day of celebration for them. So we may not have been able to prevent this legislation going through today, but let me say this, Mr. Speaker. This is not the end of the matter. As far as this party is concerned, we will take every possible legal option open to us to try and stop. If it comes into force tonight, there are other options in terms of repealing, and we will make sure that we do everything we can in our conscience to protect the life of the unborn. Point of order, Mr. Swan. Mr. Speaker, in, in light of where we are now in this chamber and those present, um, we'll not be nominating someone for Speaker. I think this chamber in Northern Ireland has lost a very important and credible institution today in the actions that have happened within this chamber. Because I think there is a clear signal now to the people of Northern Ireland, to the people who are no longer in this chamber that they devalue democracy in Northern Ireland. We are a democratic party. We believe in the devolved institutions of Northern Ireland. But and with what we've seen here today, I call now on the Secretary of State to actually implement serious five-party intensive talks that see if this place is actually worth restoring again. 
because the fact that there are only ourselves, the TUV and the independent member for East London Derry sitting in here, who realise the opportunity that has been missed here today. One over 1,000 days, a health service crumbling, principals and schools not knowing where their budget lies, our infrastructure falling to part, business not knowing if it's worthwhile being in Northern Ireland anymore. And we have missed this opportunity today. There were serious issues that could have been talked about. There are serious issues that affect everybody in Northern Ireland. And this pantomime, this fiasco today, has, I think, demonstrated surely to the Secretary of State that now is the time that this place be given serious consideration if it has any future. Here, here. Here, here. I understand the points you are making are political points and not for my remit to respond to, Mr. Strawn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, will you confirm that any legislation that this House may pass um, would indeed be compatible with the Westminster legislation, given that this House is, in, is in subordinate to the, 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 the Westminster Chamber? I suppose what I'm saying is, is that if, if we were to be successful in passing out any legislation in this House, would it um, supersede the legislation that will now come into effect tomorrow um, or as of midnight tonight? Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Sugden, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not quite clear about what you're saying, but legislation that is made in Northern Ireland would be Northern Ireland legislation and would not, as I understand, be subordinate to the legislation made in Westminster. Is my understanding. Speaker, the Ulster Unionist Party had tabled a recall motion for tomorrow, and I think we've gained over 30 signatures. But when we've, what we've seen here today, we have, we've withdrawn our own names from that petition, so I don't think tomorrow we'll be going ahead either. Thank you, Mr. Swan. Um. Members, uh, having been given notice of not less than 30 members under Standing Order 11, I have summoned the Assembly to meet here today for the purpose of conducting the items of business that appear on the order paper. Before we can proceed, I want to make clear the procedural constraints on this sitting. Section 39.1 of the Northern Ireland Act provides that each Assembly shall at its first business elect from among its members a presiding officer and deputies. Therefore, the Assembly cannot conduct any further business until a Speaker and at least two Deputy Speakers have been elected. Members should be clear if a Speaker and at least two Deputy Speakers are not elected, no further business can proceed. I am aware that contrary, to views on this matter have, contrary views to this matter have been expressed, but it is Universal practice elsewhere that their first action is the election of a speaker. It is a matter of common sense, as I am sure members uh, will recognise. Legally, we cannot proceed to conduct any business, including the appointment of ministers, without first electing a speaker and deputies. Members need to take the decisions that will enable the business of the Assembly to proceed. The first item of business is the election of the Speaker, and I will remain in the chair for this process. I wish to advise members that the election of the Speaker will be conducted under the procedures set out in Standing Order 4. I will begin by asking for nominations. Any member may rise to propose that another member is elected as Speaker. I will then ask for the proposal to be seconded by another member, as required by Standing Order 14. Members who have been proposed will be asked if they are willing to accept the nomination. If they do not, that proposal will fall. I will then ask for a further proposal and follow the same procedures for each. When it appears there are no further proposals, I will make it clear that time for proposals has passed. If members indicate that they wish to speak, a debate relevant to the election 
of speakers may then take place. Members will be allowed up to three minutes. At the conclusion of the debate or the conclusion of the nominations, if there are no requests to speak, I shall put the question that the member first proposed shall be Speaker of the Assembly. The vote will be on a cross-community basis. If the proposal is not carried, I shall put the question in relation to the next nominee and so on until all nominations are exhausted. Once a Speaker is elected, all other nominations will fall automatically. Do I have any proposals for the role of Speaker? Members have been unable to elect my successor today on, so the matter will be revised at a future date. We will move on to the next item of business, which was, for which I will remain in the chair. It would, it would not seem appropriate. Members, I am required to move on to the election of deputy speakers just to complete the process. The next item of business on the order paper is the election of deputy speakers. The procedure for electing deputy speakers will be the same as the election of the speaker. I will ask for proposals which must be seconded and will continue that way until there are no further proposals. Do I have any proposals for the election of deputy speaker of the Assembly? Out of courtesy for you and courtesy of this place, we will be leaving the chamber now and you will have no quorum, so I suspect, propose that the meeting be suspended. Nations for Deputy Speaker. Uh, the question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned.